chapter 55 of the monstrous pictures of whales. I shall ere long paint to you, as well as one can without canvas, something like the true form of the whale as he actually appears to the eye of the whale man when in his own absolute body the whale is moored alongside the whale ship so that he can be fairly stepped upon there. It may be worthwhile, therefore, previously to advert to those curious imaginary portraits of him, which even down to the present day confidently challenge the faith of the landsman. It is time to set the world right in this matter by proving such pictures of the whale all wrong. It may be that the primal sources of all those pictorial delusions will be found among the oldest Hindu, Egyptian, and Grecian sculptures, for ever since those inventive but unscrupulous times, when on the marble panelings of temples, the pedestals of statues, and on shields, medallions, cups, and coins, the dolphin was drawn in scales of chain armor like Saladin's, and a helmeted head like St. George's, ever since then has something of the same sort of license prevailed, not only in most popular pictures of the whale, but in many scientific presentations of him. Now by all odds, the most ancient extant portrait anyways, purporting to be the whales, is to be found in the famous cavern pagoda of Elephanta in India. The Brahmins maintain that in the almost endless sculptures of that immemorial pagoda, all the trades and pursuits, every conceivable avocation of man, were prefigured ages before any of them actually came into being. No wonder then that in some sort our noble profession of whaling should have been there shadowed forth. The Hindu whale referred to occurs in a separate department of the wall depicting the incarnation of Vishnu in the form of Leviathan, learnedly known as the Matsa Avatar. But though this sculpture is half man and half whale, so as only to give the tale of the latter, yet that small section of him is all wrong. It looks more like the tapering tail of an anaconda than the broad palms of the true whale's majestic flukes. But go to the old galleries and look now at a great Christian painter's portrait of this fish, for he succeeds no better than the antediluvian Hindu. It is Guido's picture of Perseus rescuing Andromeda from the sea monster or whale. Where did Guido get the model for such a strange creature as that? Nor does Hogarth, in painting the same scene in his own Perseus descending, make out one whit better. The huge corpulence of that Hogarthian monster undulates on the surface, scarcely drawing one inch of water. It has a sort of howdah on its back, and its distended tusked mouth, into which the billows are rolling, might be taken for the trader's gate leading from the Thames by water into the tower. Then there are the prodromus whales of old Scotch Sibold, and Jonah's whale as depicted in the prints of old Bibles and the cuts of old primers. What shall be said of these? As for the bookbinder's whale, winding like a vine stalk round the stock of a descending anchor, as stamped and gilded on the backs and title pages of many books, both old and new, that is a very picturesque but purely fabulous creature, imitated, I take it, from the like figures on antique vases. Though universally denominated a dolphin, I nevertheless call this bookbinder's fish an attempt at a whale, because it was so intended when the device was first introduced. It was introduced by an old Italian publisher somewhere around the 15th century, during the revival of learning, and in those days, and even down to a comparatively late period, dolphins were popularly supposed to be a species of the Leviathan. In the vignettes and other embellishments of some ancient books, you will at times meet with very curious touches at the whale, where all manner of spouts, jets d'eau, hot springs and cold, Saratoga and Baden-Baden, come bubbling up from his unexhausted brain. In the title page of the original edition of The Advancement of Learning, you will find some curious whales. But quitting all these unprofessional attempts, 
Let us glance at those pictures of Leviathan purporting to be sober scientific delineations by those who know. In old Harris's collection of voyages, there are some plates of whales extracted from a Dutch book of voyages, AD 1671, entitled A Whaling Voyage to Spitsbergen in the ship Jonas in the Whale, Peter Peterson of Friesland, Master. In one of those plates, the whales, like great rafts of logs, are represented lying among ice isles with white bears running over their living backs. In another plate, the prodigious blunder is made of representing the whale with perpendicular flukes. Then again, there is an imposing quarto written by one Captain Colnett, a post captain in the English Navy, entitled A Voyage Round Cape Horn into the South Seas for the purpose of extending the spermaceti whale fisheries. In this book is an outline purporting to be a picture of a physeter or spermaceti whale drawn by scale from one killed on the coast of Mexico, August 1793, and hoisted on deck. I doubt not the captain had this voracious picture taken for the benefit of his Marines. To mention but one thing about it, let me say that it has an eye which applied, according to the accompanying scale, to a full-grown sperm whale, would make the eye of that whale a bow window some five feet long. Ah, my gallant captain, why did you not give us Jonah looking out of that eye? Nor are the most contentious compliments uh, compilations of natural history for the benefit of the young and tender free from the same heinous of uh, mistakes look at the popular work Goldsmith's animated nature in the abridged London edition of 1807 there are plates of an al alligated whale and Norwell I do not wish to see inelegant but this unsightly whale looks much like an amputated sow and as for the narwhale one glimpse at it is enough to amaze one that is this 19th century such a hippogriff could be plant could be palm for genuine upon an intelligent public of schoolboys then again in 1825 Bernard Germain Count de Les Pidet, a great naturalist published a scientific specimen or systemized whale book wherein are several pictures of different species of the Leviathan all the all these are not only incorrect but the pictures of um, mysterious or Greenland whales that is to say the right whale even scored by a long experienced man as touching that species declares not to have its counterpart in nature by the placing of the cap shelf to all this blundering business was re reserved for the scientific Frederick Curvier, brother to the famous Bar Baron. In 1836, he published a natural history of whales in which he gives what he calls a picture of the sperm whale. Before showing that picture to any Nantucketer, you had best provide for your summary retreat from Nantucket. In a word, Frederick Curvier's sperm whale is not a sperm whale, but a squash. Of course, he never had the benefit of a whaling voyage. Such men seldom have. But once he derived that picture, who can tell? Perhaps he got it as, as, he scient as scientific pre uh, predecessor in the same field des Mar Maris got one of his authors authentic abortions that is from a Chinese drawing and what sort of li lively lads with the pencil those Chinese are many queer cups and saucers inform us as for sign sign painters painters whales seen in the streets hanging over the shops of oil dealers what shall be said of them they are generally Richard the third whales with domandary humps and very and very savage breakfasting on three or four sailor tarts that is whale boats full of mar mariners their deformities flundering in the seas of blood and blue paint 
But these manifold mistakes is in depicting the whale are not so very surprising after all, considering most of the scientific drawings have been taken from the standard fish, and these are about as correct as drawing of a, wrecking, of a wrecked ship with broken back would correctly respected the noble animal itself in all its, in all its undashed pride of hull and spars. Though elephants have stood for their full lengths, the living Leviathan has never yet fairly floated himself from his portrait. The living whale in his full majesty and significance is only to be seen at sea in unfathomable waters and afloat the vast bulk of him is out of sight like a, like a um, lanced line of battleship and out of the element it is an, a thing eternally imp impossible for mortal man to hoist him bodily into the air so as to perceive all his mighty swells and undulations and not to speak of the highly presumable difference of contour between a young suckle, sucking whale and full-grown palantium leviathan. Yet even in the case of one of those young sucking whale hoisted to a ship's deck such as then the outlandish eel-like limbered varying shape of him that, it, that his precise expression the devil himself could not catch, but it may be fancies that from the naked skeleton of the stranded whale, accurate hints may be derived touching his true form. Not at all, for it is one of the more curious things about this Leviathan, that his skeleton gives very little idea of his general shape. Though Jeremy Bentham's skeleton, which hangs for candelabra in the library of one of his executors, correctly conveys the idea of the burly browed utilitarian old gentleman with all Jeremy's other leading personal characteristics. Yet nothing of this kind could be inferred from any Leviathan's art articulated bones. In fact, as the great hunter says, the mere skeleton of the whale bears the same relation to the fully invested and padded animal as the insect does to the chrysalis that so roundingly envelops it. This peculiarity is strikingly evinced in the head, as in some part of this book will be incidentally shown. It is also very curiously displayed in the side fin, the bones of which almost exactly answer to the bones of the human hand, minus only the thumb. This fin has four regular bone fingers, the index, the middle, ring, and little finger. But all these are permanently lodged in their fleshy covering, as the human fingers in an artificial cover. However, recklessly the whale may sometimes serve us, the humorous dove one day. He can never truly be truly said to handle us without man's. For all these reasons, then, any way you may look at it, it must need conclude that the great Leviathan is that one creature in the world which must remain unpainted to the last. True, one portrait may hit the mark much nearer than another, but no one can hit it with very considerable degree of exactness. So there is no earthly way of finding how, out precisely what the whale really looks like. And the only mode in which you can derive e even a tolerable idea of its living contour is by going in a whaling yourself. But by doing so, you run no small risk of being eternally stove and sunk by him. It seems to be when you had pa best not to pa be fastidious in your curiosity touching his, this Leviathan. Of the less erroneous pictures of whales and the true pictures of whaling scenes. In connection with the monstrous pictures of whales, I am strongly tempted here to enter upon those still more monstrous stories of them which are found in certain books, both ancient and modern, especially in Pliny, Purchas, Hackrolt, Harris, Cuvier, and C. But I pass that matter by. I, now, I know only four published outlines of the great sperm whale, Colnitz, Huggins, Frederick Cuvier's, and Beals. In previous chapter, Colnett and Cuvier have been referred to. Huggins is far better than theirs, but by great odds, Beals is the best. 
All Beale's drawings of this whale are good, excepting the middle figure in the picture of three whales in various attitudes, calving his second chapter. His friend disputes both att attacking sperm whales, though no doubt calculated to excite the civil specitism of the same parlor man, is admirably correct and lifelike in its general effect. Some of the sperm whale drawings in J. Ross Brown are pretty correct in contour, but they are wretchedly engraved. This is not his fault, though. Of the right whale, the best outlined pictures are in scores by, but they are drawn on too small a scale to convey a desirable impression. He has but one picture of whaling scenes, and this is a sad deficiency, because it is by such pictures only, when at all well done, that you can derive anything like a truthful idea of the living whale as seen by its living hum hunters. But taken for all in all, by far the finest, though in some details not the most correct, presentations of whales and whaling scenes to be anywhere found are two large French engravings, well executed and taken from paintings by one garnery. Respectively, they represent attacks on the sperm and right whale. In the first engraving, a noble sperm is depicted in full majesty of might, just risen beneath the boat from this profundities of the ocean, and bearing high in upon the air his back, the terrific wreck of the stove and planks. The prow of the boat is partially unbroken and is drawn just balancing upon the monster's spine. And standing in that prow for that one single incomputable flash of that time, you behold an oarsman, half shrouded by the incensed boiling spout of the whale and in the act of leaping also if from a precipitous. The action of the whole thing is wonderfully good and true. The half-emptied line tub floats on the white and sea. The wooden poles of the spilled harpoons obliquely bob in it. The heads of the swimming crew are scattered about the whale in contrasting expressions of affright. While in a black stormy distance, the ship is bearing down upon the sea. Serious fault might be found with the anatomical details of this whale. But let it pass, since for the life of me, I cannot draw one so good. In the second engraving, the boat is the act of drawing alongside the barnacled flank of a large running right whale that rolls his back weedy bulk in the sea like some mossy rock slide from the Pantagonian cliffs. His jets are erect, full and black like soot, so that from the abounding about smoke in the chimney, you would think there must be a brave supper cooking in the great bowels below. Sea fowls are packing at the small crabs, shellfish, and other sea candies, and macaroni, which the right whale sometimes carries on his pestilent black. And all the while, the thick cliff the viathan is rushing through the deep, leaving tons of uh, tremulous white curds in his wake, and causing the slight boat to rock in the swells like a skiff caught nigh the paddle wheel of the ocean steamer. Thus the foreground is all raging commotion, but behind an admirable artistic contrast is the glassy level of a sea becalmed, the drooping unscarched sails of the powerless ship, and the inner mass of a dead whale, a conquering fortress, with the flag of capture lazy hang from the whale pond inserted into his sprout hole. Who Garnery the painted is, or was, I know not, but my life for it he was early either practically conversant with his subject or else marvelously tutored by some experienced whalemen. The French are lads for painting action. Go and gaze upon all the paintings of Europe, and where will you find such a gallery of living and breathing commotion on canvas as in that trumphal hall of Versailles where the beholder fights his way pell-mell through the consecutive great battles of France where every sword seems a flash of the northern lights, and the successive armed kings and emperors dash by like a charge of crowned centaurs. Not wholly unworthy of a place in that gallery are these sea battle pieces of garnery. The natural aptitude of the French for seizing the picturesqueness of things seems to be peculiarly evinced in what paintings and engravings they have of whale scenes. With not one-tenth of England's experience in fishery, and not the thousandth part of that of the Americans, they have nevertheless furnished both nations with the, the only finished sketches 
at all capable of conveying the real spirit of the whale hunt. For the most part, the English and American whale draughtmen seem entirely content with presenting the mechanical outline of things, such as the vacant profile of the whale, which so far as picturesqueness of the effect is concerned, is about as tantamount to sketching the profile of a pyramid. Even Scoresby, the justly renowned right whaleman, after giving us a stiff full length of the Greenland whale and three or four delicate miniatures of the narwhals and porpoises, treats us to this series of classical engravings of boat hooks, chopping knives, and narples, uh, and with microscopic diligence, the Lewin Hawk submits to the inspection of the shivering word 96 facsimiles of the magnified Arctic snow crystals. I mean no disparagement to the excellent voyager. I honor him for a veteran. But in so important a matter, it was certainly an oversight not to have procured for every crystal a sworn advent taken before a Greenland justice of the peace. In addition to those fine engravings from Garney, there are two other French engravings worthy of note. By some one who subscribes himself D. Dirt, and one of them, though not precisely adapted to our present purpose, nevertheless deserves mention on other accounts. It is a quite noon scene among the isles of the Pacific. A French whaler anchored in shore in a calm and lazy taking water on board the lunson sails of the ship, and the long leaves of the palms in the background, both drooping together in the breezeless air. The effect is very fine when considering with reference to its presenting the hardy fishermen under one of their few aspects, oriental repose. The other engraving is quite a different affair. The ship hove on upon the open sea, and in the very heart of the Leviathanic life, with a right whale alongside their vessel, in the act of cutting in, hove over to the monster as if to a quarry, and in a boat hurriedly pushing off from the scene of activity, is about giving chase to the whales in the distance. The harpoons and laces lie leveled for use. Three oarsmen are just settling the mast in its hole, while for a sudden roll of the sea, the little craft stands half erect out of the water like a rearing horse. From the ship, the smoke of the torments of the boiling whale is going up like smoke over a village of the smithies, and to windward, a black cloud rising up with earnest of squalls and rains seems to quicken the activity of the excited seamen. Chapter 57 of Whales and Paint and Teeth and Wood and Sheet Iron and Stone and Mountains and Stars. On Tower Hill, as you go down to the London docks, you may have seen the crippled beggar, or kegger as the sailors say, holding a painted board before him, representing the tragic scene in which he lost his leg. There are three whales in three boats, and one of the boats, presumed to contain the missing leg in all its original integrity, is being crushed by the jaw of the foremost whale. Any time these ten years, they tell me, has that man held up that picture and exhibited that stump to an incredulous world. But the time of his justification has now come. Three whales are as good whales as were ever published in the Wapping, at any rate. And his stump is unquestionable a stump as you will find in the western clearings. But though forever mounted on that stump, never a stump speech does the poor whaleman make. But with downcast eyes stands ruefully contemplating his own amputation. Throughout the Pacific, and also Nantucket, and New Bedford, and Sag Harbor, you will come across lively stretches of whales and whaling scenes, graven by the fishermen themselves on sperm whale teeth, or lady busks wrought out of the right whalebone, and other like Scrip Shander's articles, as the whalemen call the numerous little ingenious contrivances and they elaborately carve out of the rough material in their hours of ocean leisure. Some of them have little boxes of dentistical looking implements, specially intended for the scrim chandering business, but in general they toil with their jackknives alone, and with that almost omnipotent tool of the sailor, they will turn you out anything you please in the way of a manner's fancy. Long exile from Christendom and civilization inevitably restores a man to that condition in which God placed him, i.e. what is called savagery. Your true whale hunter is as much a savage as an Iroquois. I myself am a savage, owing no allegiance but to the king of the cannibals, 
and ready at any moment to rebel against him. Now, one of the peculiar characteristics of the savage in his domestic hour is his wonderful patience of industry. An ancient Hawaiian war club or spear paddle in its full multiplicity and elaboration of carving is as great a trophy of human perseverance as the Latin lexicon. For with but a bit of broken seashell or shark tooth, that miraculous intricacy of wooden network has been achieved and it has cost steady years of steady application. As with the Hawaiian savage, so with the white sailor savage, with the same marvelous patience and with the same single shark tooth of his one poor jackknife, he will carve you a bit of bone sculpture, not quite as workmanlike, but as close packaged in its amazingness of design as the Greek savage Achilles' shield, and full of barbaric spirit and suggestiveness as the prince of that fine old Dutch savage, Albert Durer. Wooden whales, or whales cut in profile out of the small dark slabs of the noble South Sea Warwood, are frequently met with the forecastles of American whalers. Some of them are done with much accuracy. At some old garble roof country house, you will see brass whales hung by the tail for knockers to the roadside door. When the porter is sleepy, the anvil-headed whale would be best. But these knocking whales are seldom remarkable as fateful essays. On the spires of some old-fashioned churches, you will see sheet iron whales placed there for weathercocks. But they are so elevated, besides that, are, all to, are to all intents and purposes so labeled with hands off, you cannot examine them closely enough to decide upon their merit. In bony, ribby regions of the earth, where at the base of high broken cliff masses of rocks lie strewn in fantastic groupings upon the plain, you will often discover images of the petrified forms of the Leviathan partly merged in grass, which of a windy day breaks against them in a surf of green surges. Then again, in mountainous countries where the traveler is continually grilled by the empirical heights, here and there, for some lucky point of view, you will catch passing glimpses of the profiles of whales defined among the undulating ridges. But you must be a thorough whalesman to see these sights. And not only that, but if you wish to return to such a site again, you must be sure to take the exact intersecting latitude and longitude of your first standpoint. Else, so translate of the observations of the hills, your precise a uh, frivolous standing point would require a laborious rediscovery, like the Solomon Isles, which still remain incognita, though once high ruffled Mendinian trod them in old Figurota chronicled them. Nor when expandingly lifted by your subject can you fail to trace out great what great whales in the, in the starry heavens, and boats in pursuit of them, as when long filled with thoughts of war, the eastern nations saw armies locked in battle among the clouds. Thus at the north have I chased Leviathan round and round the pole with the revolutions of the bright points that first defined him to me. And beneath the effulgent Antarctic skies I have boarded the Argo Navis and joined the chase against the starry Cetus far beyond the utmost stretch of Hydrus and the flying fish. With the frigate's anchors for my, middle, for my bridle bits and fasces of harpoons for spurs, what I could mount that whale and leap the topmost skies to see whether the fabled heavens with all their countless tents really lie in camp beyond my mortal sight. Chapter 58, Brit. Staring north eastward from the Crozets, we fell in with the vast meadows of Brit, the minute yellow substance upon which the right whale largely feeds. For leagues and leagues it undulated around us, so that we seemed to be sailing through the boundless fields of ripe and golden wheat. On the second day, numbers of right whales were seen who, secure from the attack of a sperm whale like the Pequod, with open jaws sluggishly swam through the Brit which, adhering to the fringing fibers that wondrous, Venetian, that wondrous Venetian blind in their mouths, was in that manner separated from the water that escaped at their lip. As morning mowers, who side by side slowly and seethingly, seethingly advanced their skies through the long wet grass of marshy meads, 
Even so, these monsters swam, making a strange, grassy cutting sound and leaving behind them endless swaths of blue upon the yellow sea. But it was only the sound they made as they parted the Brit, which it all reminded one of the mowers. Seen from the mastheads, especially when they paused and were stationary for a while, their vast black forms looked more like lifeless masses of rock than anything else. And as in the great hunting countries of India, the stranger at a distance will sometimes pass on the plains recumbent elephants without knowing them to be such, taking them for bare blackened elevations of the soil. Even so, often with him, who for the first time beholds these species of the leviathans of the sea. And even when recognized at last, their immense magnitude renders it very hard really to believe that such, a bu such bulky masses of overgrown can possibly, possibly be instinct in all parts with the same sort of life that lives in a dog or a horse. Indeed, in other respects, you can hardly regard any creatures of the deep with the same feelings that you do with those of the shore. For though some old naturalists have maintained that all creatures of the land are of their kind in the sea, and though taking a broad general view of the thing, this may very well be. Yet coming to specialities where, for example, does the ocean furnish any fish in disposition that answers to the sagacious kindness of the dog? The accursed shark alone can in any generic respect be said to bear comparatively an analogy to him. But though, to landsmen in general, the native inhabitants of the seas have ever been regarded with emotions unspeakably unsocial and repelling, though we know the sea to be an everlasting terror incognita, so that Columbus sailed over numberless unknown worlds to discover his one, his one superficial western one, though by vast odds the most terrific of all mortal disasters have immemorial and indiscriminately befalling tens of hundreds of thousands of those who have gone upon the waters. Though but a moment's consideration will teach that however baby man may brag of his science and skill, and however much in a flattering future that science and skill may augment, yet forever and ever to the crack of doom the sea will insult and murder him and pulverize the state, stateliest, stiffest frigate that he can make. Nevertheless, by the continual repetition of these very impressions, man has lost that sense of the full awfulness of the sea which ab aboriginally belongs to it. The first boat we read of floated on an ocean that with Portuguese vengeance had whelmed a world without leaving so much as a widow. That same ocean rolls now, that same ocean destroyed the wrecked ships of last year. Yea, foolish mortals, Noah's flood has not yet subsided. Two-thirds of the fair world it yet, it yet covers. Wherein differ the sea and the land, that a miracle upon one is not a miracle upon the other? Prenatural terrors rested upon the Hebrews when under the feet of Korah and his company the live ground opened and swallowed them up forever. Yet not a modern sun ever sets but in precisely the same manner the live sea swallows up ships and crews. But not only is the sea such a foe to man who is alien to it, but it is also a fiend to, those, to its own offspring, worse than the, than the Persian host who murdered his own guest, sparing not the creatures itself hath spawned. Like a savage tigress tossing in the jungle overlays her own cubs, so the sea dashes even the mightiest whales against the rocks and leaves them there to side by side with split wrecks of ships. No mercy, no power, but its own controls it. Panting and snorting like a mad battle steed that has lost its rider, the masterless ocean overruns the globe. Consider the subtleness of the sea, how its most dreaded creatures glide underwater, unapparent for the most part, and treacherously hidden beneath the loveliest tints of Asia. Consider also the devilish brilliance and beauty of many of its most remorseless tribes as the dainty embellished shape of many species of sharks. Consider once more the universal cannibalism of the sea. All those creatures prey upon each other, carrying on eternal war since the world began. Consider all this 
and then turn to the green, gentle, and most do docile earth. Consider them both, the sea and the land. And do you not find a strange analogy to something in yourself? For in this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insula Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but accompanied by all the horrors of the half-known life. God keep thee. Push off not from that isle, thou canst never return. Chapter 59, Squid. Slowly wading through the meadows of Brit, the Pequod still held on her way northeastward towards the island of Java, a gentle air impelling her keel, so that in the surrounding serenity her three tall tapering masts mildly waved to that languid breeze as three mild palms on a plain. <clears throat> and still at wide intervals in the silvery night, a lonely alluring jet could be seen. But one transparent blue morning, when the stillness almost pre was prenatural spread over the sea, however unattended with any stagnant calm, when the long burnished sun glade over the waters seemed a golden finger laid across them, enjoy enjoining some secrecy, when the slippered waves whispered together as they softly ran on, in this profound hush of vis visible sphere, a strange specter was seen by Dagu from the mainmast. In the distance, a great white mass lazily rose, and rising higher and higher, and disentangl disentangling itself from the Asia, at last gleamed before our prow like a snowslide, new slid from the hills. Thus glistening for a moment, as slowly as it subsided, and sank. Then once more arose and silently gleamed. It seemed not a whale, and yet, is this Moby Dick? Thought Dagoo. Again the phantom went down, but on reappearing once more, with a stiletto-like cry that startled every man from his nod, the negro yelled out, There, there again, there she breaches, right ahead, the white whale, the white whale. Upon this, the seamen rushed to the yard arms, and in a swarming time, as in swarming time, like bees rushing to the bow, from the bows. Bareheaded in the sultry sun, Ahab stood on the bowsprit, and with one hand pushed far behind in readiness to wave his orders to the helmsman, cast his eager glance in the direction indicated aloft by the outstretched motionless arm of Dagoo. <clears throat> Whether the fitting attendance of the one still and solitary jet had gradually worked upon Ahab so that he was now prepared to connect the ideas of mildness and repose with the first sight of the particular whale he pursued, however this was, or whether his eagerness betrayed him, whichever way it might have been, no sooner did he distinctly perceive the white mass than with a quick intensity he, inst he instantly gave orders for lowering. The four boats were soon on the water, Ahab's in advance, and all swiftly pulling toward their prey. Soon it went down, and while, with oars suspended, we were awaiting its reappearance, lo, in the same spot where it sank, once more it slowly rose. Almost forgetting for the moment all thoughts of Moby Dick, we now gazed at the most wonderful phenomenon which the secret seas have hitherto revealed to mankind. A vast pulpy mass, furlongs in length and breadth, of a glancing cream color, lay floating on the water, innumerable long arms radiating from its center, and curling and twisting like a nest of anacondas, as if blindly to clutch at any hapless object within reach. No perceptible face or front did it have, no conceivable token or, uh, of either sensation or, or instinct, but undulated there on the billows an unearthly, formless, chance-like apparition of life. As with a low sucking sound, it slowly disappeared again, Starbuck still gazing at the agitated waters where it had sunk, with a wild voice exclaimed, Almost rather I had seen Moby Dick and fought him than to have seen thee, thou white ghost. What was it, sir? asked Flass. The great live squid, which they say few whale ships have ever beheld, and returned to their ports to tell of it. But Ahab said nothing, turning his boat. 
he sailed back to the vessel, the rest as silently following. Whatever superstitions the sperm whalemen in general have connected with the sight of this object, certain it is that a glimpse of it being so very unusual that circumstance has gone far to invent it, invest it with portentousness. So rarely is it beheld that though one and all of them declare it to be the largest animated thing in the ocean, yet very few of them have any but the most vague idea concerning its true nature and form. Notwithstanding, they believe it to furnish to the sperm whale the, his only food. For though other species of whales find their food above water and may be seen by man in the act of feeding, the spermaceti whale obtains his whole food in unknown zones below the surface, and only by inference is it that anyone can tell of what precisely that food consists. At time, when closely pursued, he will disgorge what are supposed to be the detached arms of the squid, some of them thus exhibited exceeding 20 and 30 feet in length. They fancy that the monster to which these arms belonged ordinarily clings by them to the bed of the ocean, and that the sperm whale, unlike other species, is supplied with teeth in order to attack it and tear it. There seems, there seems some ground to imagine that the great kraken of Bishop, of Bishop uh, Pantopatodan hmm, may ultimately resolve their own, uh, itself into squid. The manner in which the bishop describes it as alternately rising and sinking with some other particulars he narrates is all this the two correspond. But much abatement is necessary with respect to the incredible bulk he assigns it. By some naturalists who have vaguely heard rumors of the mysterious creature here spoken of, it is included among the class of cuttlefish, which, uh, to which indeed uh, in certain external prospects, respects it would seem to belong but only as the Anak of the tribe. Chapter 60, the line. With reference to the whaling scenes shortly to be described, as well as for the better understanding of all similar scenes elsewhere presented, I have here to speak of the magical, sometimes horrible, whale line. The line originally used in the fishery was of the best hemp, slightly vapored with tar, not impregnated with it, as in the case of ordinary ropes. For while tar, as ordinarily used, makes the hemp more pliable to the rope maker and also renders the rope itself more convenient to the sailor for common ship use, yet not only would the ordinary quantity too much stiffen the whale line for the close coiling to which it must be subjected, but as most seamen are beginning to learn, tar in general by no means adds to the rope's durability or, or strength, however much it may give it compactness and gloss. Of late years, manila rope has in the American fishery almost entirely superseded hemp as a material for whale lines. For though not so durable as hemp, it is stronger and far more soft and elastic. And I will add, since there is an aesthetic in all things, is much more handsome and becoming to the boat than hemp. Hemp is a dusky, dark fellow, a sort of Indian. But manila is as a golden-haired Circassian to behold. The whale line is only two-thirds of an inch in thickness. At first sight, you would not think it so strong as it really is. By experiment, its one and fifty yarns will each suspend a weight of 120 pounds, so that the whole rope will bear a strain nearly equal to three tons. In length, the common sperm whale line measures something over 200 fathoms. Towards the stern of the boat, it is spirally coiled away in the tub, not, unlike, not like the worm pipe uh, of a still though by uh, so as to form one round, cheese-shaped mass of densely bedded sheaves or layers of concentric sterilizations, without any hollow but the heart or minute vertical tube formed at the axis of the cheese. At the least tangle or kink in the coiling, would, in running out, infallibly take someone's arm, leg, or entire body off. The utmost precaution is used in stowing the line in the tub. Some harpooners will consume almost an entire morning in this business, carrying the line high aloft and then reeving it downward through the block toward the tub, so as in the act of coiling to free it from all possible wrinkles and twists. In the English boats, two tubs are used instead of one, the same line being continuously coiled in both tubs. There is some advantage in this because these twin tubs being so small, they fit more readily into the boat and do not strain it so much whereas the American tub, nearly three feet in diameter and of proportionate depth, makes a rather bulky freight for a craft whose planks are about one half inch in thickness. 
for the bottom of the whale boat is like critical ice, which will bear up, bear up a considerable distributed weight, but not very much of a concentrated one. When the painted canvas cover is clapped on the American line tub, the boat looks as if it were pulling off with a prodigious great wedding cake to present to the whales. Both ends of the line are exposed, the lower, end the lower end terminating in the eye splicer loop coming up from the bottom against the side of the tub and hanging over the edge, completely disengaged from everything. The arrangement of the lower end is necessary on two accounts. First, in order to facilitate the fastening to it of an additional line from a neighboring boat in case the stricken whale should sound so deep as to threaten to carry off the entire line originally attached to the harpoon. In these instances, the whale, of course, is shifted like a mug of ale, as it were, from the one boat to the other, through the first boat always, although the first boat always hovers at hand to assist its consort. Second, this arrangement is indispensable for common safety's sake, for were the lower end of the line in any way attached to the boat, and were the whale then to run the line out to the end almost as a single sm uh, smoking minute, as he sometimes does, he would not stop there, for the doomed boat would infallibly be dragged down after him into the profundity of the sea. And in that case, no town crier would ever find her again. Before lowering the boat for the chase, the upper end of the line is taken aft from the tub, and passing round the loggerhead there is again carried forward the entire length of the boat, resting crosswise upon the loom or handle of every man's oar, so that it jogs against the wrist in rowing and also passing between the men as they alternately sit at the opposite gunnels. To the leaded chocks or grooves in the extreme pointed prow of the boat where a wooden pin or skewer the size of a common quill prevents it from slipping out. From the chocks it hangs in a slight festoon over the bows and is, there, is then passed inside the boat again and some 10 or 20 fathoms called box line being coiled upon the box in the bows. It continues its way to the gunwale still a little farther aft and is then attached to the short warp, the rope which is immediately connected to, with the harpoon. But previous to that connection, the short warp goes through sundry mystifications too tedious to detail. Thus the whale line folds the whole boat in its complicated coils, twisting and writhing around it in almost every direction. All the oarsmen are involved in its perilous contortions so that to the timid eye of the landsmen, they seem as Indian jugglers, with the deadliest snakes sportively festooning their limbs. Nor can any son of mortal woman, for the first time, seat himself amid those hempen intricacies, and while straining his utmost at the oar, bethink him that at any unknown instant the harpoon may be darted, and all these horrible contortions be put in play like ringed lightnings. He cannot thus be circumstanced without a shudder that makes the very marrow of his bones to quiver in him like a shaken jelly. Yet habit, strange thing, what cannot habit accomplish? Gayer sallies, more merry mirth, better jokes, and brighter repartees you never heard over your mahogany than you'll hear over the half-inch white cedar of the whaleboat. When thus hung in hangman's nooses, and, like the six burghers of Calais before King Edward, the six men composing the crew pull into the jaws of death with a halter around every neck, as you may say. Perhaps a very little thought will now enable you to account for these repeated whaling disasters, some few of which are casually chronicled of this man or that man being taken out of the boat by the line and lost. For when the line is darting out, to be seated then in the boat is like being seated in the midst of the manifold whizzings of a steam engine in full play, when every flying beam and shaft and wheel is grazing you. It is worse, for you cannot sit motionless in the heart of these perils because the boat is rocking like a cradle and you are pitched one way and the other, without the slightest warning, and only by a certain self-adjusting buoyancy and simultaneousness of volition and action can you escape being made a mazeppa of and run away with where the all-seeing sun himself could never pierce you out. Again, as a profound calm which only apparently precedes and prophecies of the storm, 
is perhaps more awful than the storm itself, for indeed the calm is but the wrapper and envelope of the storm and contains it in itself as the seemingly harmless rifle holds the fatal powder and the ball and the explosion. So the graceful respot, repose of the line as it silently serpentines about the oarsman before being brought into actual play. This is a thing which carries more of true terror than any other aspect of this dangerous affair. But why say more? All men live enveloped in whale lines. All are born with halters round their necks, but it is only when caught in the swift, sudden turn of death that mortals realize the silent, subtle, ever-present perils of life. And if you'd be a philosopher, though seated in the whale boat, you would not at heart feel one whit more of terror than those seated before your evening fire with a poker and not a harpoon by your side. Chapter 61, Stubb Kills a Whale. If to Starbuck the apparition of the squid was a thing of portents, to Queequeg it was quite a different object. When you see him quid, said the savage, honing his harpoon in the bow of his hoisted boat, then you quick see him parm whale. The next day was exceedingly still and sultry, and with nothing special to engage them, the Pequod's crew could hardly resist the spell of sleep induced by such a vacant sea. For this part of the Indian Ocean, through which we then were voyaging, is not what women call a lively ground. That is, it affords fewer glimpses of porpoises, dolphins, flying fish, and other vivacious denizens of more stirring waters than those off the Rio de la Plata or the inshore ground off Peru. It was my turn to stand at the foremast head, and with my shoulders leaning against the slackened royal shrouds, to and fro I idly swayed in what seemed an enchanted air. No resolution could withstand it, in that dreamy mood losing all consciousness. At last my soul went out of my body. Though my body still continued to sway as a pendulum will, long after the power which first moved it is withdrawn, air forgetfulness altogether came over me. I had noticed that the seamen at the main and mizzen mastheads were already drowsy, so that at last all three of us lifelessly swung from the spars, and for every swing that we made, there was a nod from below from the slumbering helmsman. The waves, too, nodded their indolent crests, and across the wide trance of the sea, east nodded to west, and the sun over all. Suddenly bubbles seemed bursting beneath my closed eyes like vices, my hands grasped the shrouds. Some invisible, gracious agency preserved me. With a shock, I came back to life, and lo, close under our lee, not 40 fathom, fathoms off, a gigantic sperm whale lay rolling in the water like a capsized hull of a frigate. His broad, glossy back of an Ethiopian hue glistened in the sun's rays like a mirror but lazily undulating in the trough of the sea and ever and anon tranquilly spouting his vapory jet, the whale looked like a portly burger smoking his pipe of a warm afternoon. But that pipe, poor whale, was thy last. As if struck by some enchanter's wand, the sleepy ship and every sleeper in it all at once started into wakefulness. And more than a score of voices from all parts of the vessel, simultaneously, the three notes from aloft, shouted forth the accustomed cry as the great fish slowly and regularly spouted the sparkling brine into the air. Clear away the boats, luff, cried Ahab, and obeying his own order, he dashed the helm down before the helmsman could handle the spokes. The sudden exclamations of the crew must have alarmed the whale. And ere the boats were down, majestically turning, he swam away to the leeward. But with such a steady tranquility, and making so few ripples as he swam, that thinking, after all, he might not as yet be alarmed, Ahab gave orders 
that not an oar should be used, and no man must speak but in whispers. So seated like Ontario Indians on the gunwales of the boats, we swiftly but silently paddled along, the calming, the calm not admitting of the noiseless sails being set. Presently, as we thus glided in chase, the monster perpendicularly flitted his tail 40 feet into the air and then sank out of sight like a tower swallowed up. There go flukes, was the cry, an announcement immediately followed by Stubbs producing his match and igniting his pipe, for now a respite was granted. After the full interval of his sounding had elapsed, the whale rose again, and being now in advance of the smoker's boat, and much nearer to it than to any of the others, Stubb counted upon the honor of the capture. It was obvious now that the whale had at length become aware of his pursuers. All silence of cautiousness was therefore no longer of use. Paddles were dropped, and oars came loudly into play. And still puffing at his pipe, Stuff cheered on his crew to the assault. Yes, a mighty change had come over the fish. All alive to his jeopardy, he was going head out, that part obliquely projecting from the mad yeast which he brewed. Start her, start her, my men. Don't hurry yourselves, take plenty of time, but start her. Start her like thunderclaps, that's all, cried Stubb, spluttering out the smoke as he spoke. Start her now. Give him the long and strong stroke, Tash Tego. Start her, Tash, my boy. Start her all. But keep cool, keep cool. Cucumbers is the word. Easy, easy. Only start her like grim death and gritting devils and raise the buried dead perpendicular out of their graves, boys. That's all. Start her. Woo-hoo! Why? Screamed the gay header in reply, raising some old war whoop to the skies. Is every oarsman in the strain boat involuntarily bounced forward with the one tremendous leading stroke which the eager Indian gave. But his wild screams were answered by others, quite as wild. Kee-hee, kee-hee, yelled Dagoo, straining forwards and backwards on his seat like a pacing tiger in his cage. Kala kalu, howled Kuliquag as if smacking his lips over a mouthful of gren grenadier steak. And thus with oars and yells, the keels cut the sea. Meanwhile, Stubb, retaining his place in the van, still encouraged his men to the onset, all the while puffing the smoke from his mouth. Like desperados, they tugged and they strained till the welcome cry was heard. Stand up, Tashtigo, give it to him. The harpoon was hurled, stern, all. The oarsmen backed water. The same moment, something went hot and hissing along every one of their wrists. It was the magical line. An instant before, Stubb had swiftly caught two additional turns with it round the loggerhead, whence, by reason of its increased rapid circlings, a hempen blue smoke now jetted up and mingled with the steady fumes from his pipe. As the line passed round and round the loggerhead, so also, just before reaching that point, it blisteringly passed through and through both of Stubb's hands from which the hand cloths, or squares of quilted canvas, sometimes worn at these times, had accidentally, had accidentally dropped. It was like holding an enemy's sharp two-edged sword by the blade, and that enemy all the time striving to wrest it out of your clutch. Wet the line, wet the line, cried Stubb to the tub oarsman, him seated by the tub, who, snatching off his hat, dashed the seawater into it. More turns were taken, so that the line began holding its place. The boat now flew through the boiling water like a shark all fins. Stubb and Tashtigo here changed places, stem for stern, a staggering business truly in that rocking commotion. From the vibrating line extending the entire length of the upper part of the boat, and from its now being more tight than a harp string, you would have thought the craft had two keels, one cleaving the water, the other the air as the boat churned on through both opposing elements at once. A continual cascade played at the bows, a ceaseless whirling eddy in her wake, and at the slightest motion from within, even but of a little finger, the vibrating, cracking craft cantered her spasmodic 
gunwale into the sea. Thus they rushed, each man with might and main clinging to his seat to prevent being tossed to the foam. And the tall form of Toshigo at the steering oar crouching almost double in order to bring down his center of gravity. Whole Atlantics and Pacifics seemed passed as they shot on their way, till at length the whale somewhat slackened his flight. Haul in, haul in, cried Stubb to the bowsman, and facing round towards the whale, all hands began pulling the boat up to him, while yet the boat was being towed on. Soon, ranging up by his flank, Stubb, firmly planting his knee in the clumsy cleat, darted dart after dart into the flying fish. At the word of command, the boat alternately sterning out of the way of the whale's horrible wallow and then ranging up for another fling. The red tide now poured from all sides of the monster like books down a hill. His tormented body rolled not in brine but in blood, which bubbled and seethed for furlongs behind in their wake. The slanting sun played upon this crimson pond in the sea, sent back its reflection in, into every face so that they all glowed to each other like red men. And all the while, jet after jet of white smoke was agonizingly shot from the spherical of the whale, and vehement puff after puff from the mouth of the excited headsman, as at every dart, hauling in upon his crooked lance, by the line attached to it, Stubb straightened it again and again, by a few rapid blows against the gunwale, and then again and again sent it into the whale. Pull up, pull up, he now cried to the bowsman, as a waning whale relaxed in his wrath. Pull up, close to, and the boat ranged along the fish's flank. When reaching far over the bow, Stubb slowly churned his long, sharp lance into the fish and kept it there, carefully churning and churning, as if cautiously seeking to feel after some gold watch that the whale might have swallowed and which he was fearful of breaking ere he could hook it out. But that gold watch he sought was the innermost life of the fish, and now it is struck. For, starting from his trance into that unspeakable thing called his flurry, the monster, horribly wallowed in his blood, overwrapped himself in impenetrable, mad, boiling spray, so that the imperiled craft, instantly dropping astern, had much ado blindly to struggle out from that frenzied twilight into the clear air of the day. And now abating in his flurry, the whale once more rolled out into view, surging from side to side, spasmo spasmodically dilating, contracting his spout hole with sharp, cracking, agonized respirations. At last, gush after gush of clotted red gore, as if it had been the purple leaves of red wine shot into the frightened air, and falling back, ran dripping down his motionless flanks into the sea. His heart had burst. He's dead, Mr. Stubb. Yes, both pipes smoked out, and withdrawing his own from his mouth, Stubb scattered the dead ashes over the water, and for a moment stood thoughtfully eyeing the vast corpse he had made. 